Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Bowman, Editor-in-Chief of Supply Chain Brain, and I want to welcome you to the third in a three-part series of webinars on the theme of the quest for visibility and resilience. Is the existing supply chain data being underutilized, or do we need more of it? Presented by Tive. Now, in our previous episode, we set forth on the quest for the enlightened supply chain. Today's episode is entitled, Can End-to-End -end Enterprises Succeed This Time Around? Controlling the Chain Without Breaking the Bank. Quick note, there will be an audience question and answer session at the end of this presentation. Audience members are encouraged to submit your questions at any time during the presentation by clicking on that Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Now, in the last part of this series, we're going to discuss how today's leading companies plan to reduce lead time variability by harnessing visibility and utilizing dynamic routing through high-velocity decision-making processes. With that, I want to introduce our speakers for today. Dr. Yossi Sheffi is the Elisha Gray II Professor of Engineering Systems at MIT, where he serves as Director of the Center for Transportation and Logistics. He's an expert in systems optimization, risk analysis, and supply chain management. Dr. Sheffi consults with leading enterprises, has founded or co-founded five successful companies, and is the author of eight books. Krenar Kamoni is the founder and CEO of Tive, the global supply chain visibility company. Krenar has developed breakthrough ideas in data analytics, logistics, and electronics design for nearly 20 years. He has led cross-functional teams while enhancing business performance in sales, finance, supply chain logistics, distribution, and manufacturing. And Erez Agmoni is Senior Vice President of Innovation and Strategic Growth for North America at Maersk. Dr. Agmoni is a business executive with more than 25 years of industry experience in supply chain management, freight forwarding, logistics, engineering, and digital innovation. In his current role, he's leading a team of leaders into improved performance, revenue growth, and increasing profit margins. So, in the last episode with Art Mesher of Clean Slate DNA, we discussed the three Vs, visibility, variability, and velocity. Today, we're going to focus on the variability aspects of supply chain management. And with that, I want to get into the panel discussion with our guests. Hello, everybody. Great to have you all back with us again. I'm going to start off with a question. I think I'm going to direct it to Yossi Sheffi. And that's just sort of a table setting question. And here it is. What is variability in supply chains and what is its impact? Thank you, Bob. Uh, well, that's what we're talking about, of course. But you can, you can think about variability, variability is change, unexpected change, basically. Un you know, surprise that's coming from you, you know, to left field. Because you can have long lead time, you can have a planned shutdown. If you anticipate it, if, you know, it doesn't have a, a, a bad impact on you. But basically, Variability comes from several sources. First of all, demand variability. This has been with us always. Uh, it, well, de, you know, nobody called their supermarket and said, 10 days from now, I want a gallon of milk. Please have it ready for me. <laughs> I mean, the supermarket just hopes that they'll have enough milk for anybody who will show up. They don't get any warning for you. This is the usual you know, type of, of demand variability. Of course, during the pandemic, and because of the you know uh, geopolitical uh, issue, we have unprecedented level of demand variability as well, because customers change what they buy, because uh, all the uh, problems in uh, in the supply chain. Um, so, but so uh, demand variability grew. However, what was so jarring during the pandemic was the huge increase in supply variability. And supply variability is, well, this is some supply variability. I mean, you, you make chips, you don't know what kind of yield you get from the uh, from a wafer, but it was within, you know, bounds. Uh, we start having huge supply chain variability. That's what brought the concept of supply chain to the masses, basically. The fact that they realized that things are just not on the shelf or not ready to buy or the car is not, uh, in the dealership because of supply variability. And the supply variability came from several sources. 
first of all, plants were closed because the region was closed because of pandemic, because workers didn't show up, you know, production went up and down. Then it's a, a transportation variability because of a congestion, because of the huge increase uh, in demand and the huge increase in, in buying, ports became congested and it has a huge, um, a huge effect on all other parts of the transportation system. We started having problem with chassis at the port, problem with containers, warehouse. Warehouse right now are, are you know, you know, totally full. You, you cannot get warehouse space. In fact, the, the, the Wall Street Journal yesterday had an article about people storing their stuff in containers and truck and, and, uh, and trailers outside, which means, by the way, it makes the situation worse because these, a lot. these containers and yeah. these uh, trailers cannot be in service of, of the transportation system. So, and railroads are being, and it's all, it's all congested. So we start having problems. So there are problems in, in production, goes up and down. We see what's going on in China. I, you know, we, we have a center in uh, uh, Ningbo. One case, one case a few weeks ago in a, in a city of 10 million people in a huge port, and the port was closed. The city was closed because of one case. So there's a whole you know, problem. And we read about it. We read about what happened in, in Shanghai, which is a huge manufacturing center. and, and it, huge port. So these things have uh, reverberated throughout the world. Of course, the war in Ukraine, the problem with uh, food production, with uh, wheat and uh, uh, fertilizer, again, reverberate through the world. All this basically create, you know, increase and decreases in what people can get, in the type of things that people can, uh, can get. And, and companies are getting caught with a lot of inventory, as, as we see. Retailers, in particular, are getting caught with a long in, in the wrong inventory because they bought it before they realized that people are changing the habit. People are now anticipating recession, um, experiencing significant inflation, so they change what they buy. And you know, the stuff that's coming from from China is still the stuff that was ordered months ago. And so people are missing the selling season. People are uh, have their own stuff. All of this stuff creates and feeds on itself. We have more and more variability, which is unexpected changes. Too much inventory, too little warehouse space, not enough transportation assets, not <laughs> in lead time that they change all the time. All of these are sources of variability, and that's what we are talking about. So variability is built into the very nature of supply chains, but variability today has been particularly turbocharged by current events and, and conditions. Fortunately, we have someone who's in the very trenches of the experience, and that is uh, Erez Agmoni of Maersk. And to, I'd like to direct a question to you, uh, Erez, on variability, and that is specifically, what is the lead time variability in today's environment as you are experiencing it? Thank you, Bob, for this question. Definitely something that uh, I, I see and see it close from, from the work we're doing with our customers. So I, first of all, I, I like to echo Yossi's uh, talk about the sources of viability, uh, the fact that this viability that we see today is basically leading into the bullwhip effect that we all are aware of and, and creating, you know, the isolation of the problem is just uh, getting bigger and pre bigger. Now, in Maersk, what we did, we, we wanted to understand how terrible is that lead time variability that customers of ours always complain about. So um, a few years back, just before COVID started, uh, my team basically we took one million worth of shipments, one million shipments data uh, from the moment it's entered the port at origin, and we we actually decided to look into that from uh, China to the U.S. because that's kind of still the largest country-to-country uh, -country trade that you could see. So we said, okay, let's look into something relatively simple, China to US, there's not too much stops along the way, and let's minimize it instead of end-to-end, -end, let's just focus on the port, entering the port and ready to depart from the port. So it means custom cleared off the vessel, etc. So it's not just the movement on the water, but it's in the port as well. 
And let's understand what does it mean uh, viability there. So about a million shipments of uh, slightly, almost like a year uh, worth of, of uh, data. Um, and, and basically what we discovered is that the transit time, it's anywhere, was anywhere between 34 days to 74 days. Oh my goodness. <laughs> 34 days, let me repeat that because that's, it was shocked me, 34 days to 74 days. Now think about you're gonna end the end to end. This is gonna be something around 34 days to 150 days when you talk about really the whole accordion now. And this is something that when we talk to our customers, we went back to check with our customers, how do they deal with that? And th that was a nightmare for them because that's basically what bringing them to buy more, to bring a much larger safety stocks, to fill up more warehouses, to order <laughs> way in advance before they even know what customer will want. And this is kind of a source of all evil. I will not say all evil, but one big evil in supply chain. It's, it's basically um, something that we, we have to try to solve and to reduce that viability, to bring it in much more concise. It doesn't have to be shorter time, but in a much more concise in terms of viability to, to what we be promising the customers. Wow. Well, yeah. Bernard, let, me, let me just let me add there that the, it's not only concise, concise would be great, but if we can find a way to let people know when it's going to be 73 days, as opposed yes. to they, they expect to give me 34 days, this will be a step in the right direction. It's not going to, it's not going to make it concise, but it allows, it will allow them to better manage the, you know, the variability. The, but, but the question here will be, you'll see, how how much in advance can you tell them that right yeah <laughs> if it's already on the, water or on the way and you just tell them yes it will arrive so okay what do i do now nothing right mm -hmm. if you if you bet if you're able to do that notification way before it departs somewhere then you can actually take action and start changing things right. so this is a very important point uh, what you say you're right but if you say if you can do it if you if you find there's a delay in the departure point of course it's much better than you find out that it's just waiting at the arrival port and waiting on the dock and nobody knows two days away <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's yeah. two days away and a good day and it can be three weeks away I mean, it's, but Ariz, I'm just wondering, what are some of the factors that make a difference between 34 and 75 or however many? I mean, what happens to a container on a ship that causes it to be twice as long in getting there as you as was anticipated? So I, I think one of the biggest problems that we see today, and, and maybe people will jump on me here and say, well, I'm crazy, but... Uh, well, you're in this bear, business, so you must be crazy, but yeah, go on. Bear, bear with me to, to, <laughs> to my, my thoughts here. Uh, I think, first of all, there are multiple handling points and, and vendors along the, uh, along the way. Every time you move the business from one vendor to another vendor, everybody is hands off. That I did my job. I don't care. I don't care about the, the total end to end anymore. All I care is my small window of, of moving the, con the container or, or whatever, uh, air freight or whatever it is. All I care is from A to B and, and that's it. <clears throat> the second thing is that customers prescribe the suppliers or, or the vendors how to move the cargo. Now, think about this slightly different. And, and then when you, you, you're prescribing the, the way you should move it from A to B, then hand it over to the other guys and they should move it from B to C and they need to do it this way and not that way. So all this is great, but why do they do that? They do that because they don't trust anybody along the, along the route, right? Because the trust is zero. So they say, I will control my shipment. I know what's going on. But think about uh, when, you, when you send the package with a courier today and you take your package and you actually give it and you say, I want it there. I want it in three or four days and make it happen. You don't actually, they provide you the best visibility in the world, those, uh, those uh, integrators, but they, you don't go and check if they move from here to here, from there to there. You don't tell them move it via Memphis or move it via Cincinnati or move it via here. You know that it will arrive on time 
99.9% of the time. So you don't even bother to check the visibility. So I think the visibility is super important to be there, but you need to be able to trust your suppliers or yeah. even better one supplier that you can actually handle this end to end and control that. Let, let me bring one, Krenar one thing, in on just, this. Yeah, just Krenar, I wanted to, to ask you too. Uh, go, go on, on go on. No, I was just gonna add to Erez's point. There's one difference is on payments. We pay that courier upfront. Whereas in the other cases, we pay it net 30, net 60, right? Like there's, it, it, but I think that's that's because it's a small shipment versus if you are a large customer, yeah. even that carrier don't get up front. No, but, right? but the yeah. point the point that the uh, errors make it's clear through year decades of research at, uh, at MIT. The problem are usually in the you know when you change mode when you go to a terminal when you run from when the ship sails for example or the airplane takes off or the truck takes off the time is determined we know more or less what it is yeah. the problem is to go through the uh, you know terminals to go through the change of mode to go to the change of uh, um, change of supplier point Eris is uh, absolutely right that's where all the problems are okay I, I again i want to bring in Krenar. i want to get your your perspective though on what you see as the main factors that are contributing to lead time variability throughout the supply chain I, I agree 100% with Yossi and Erez on all the points, but I look at there's, and Yossi brought it up really well, right? Demand variability, supply variability, and yeah. then you have the transportation piece. But if you look at the transportation piece that Erez was talking about, if there was one party or one mode of transportation, if it's a truck moving from port to distribution center, you know that variability pretty well. Maybe it's plus minus six hours. Maybe it's plus minus a day. Same with sometimes uh, on, on ocean, if there's no transfers there as it's like, it's it's pretty pretty accurate. If, when it leaves the port and when it arrives at the port on ocean, it's plus minus, a, plus minus a day. So it's the variability at one party and one mode of transportation is, but there is variability. And then when you go to the next one, when there's multiple parties, that's when variability starts becoming much bigger because you have the plus minus days, plus minus hours on multiple parties. But then when the handoff, that's where the variability starts to grow, not from days, sometimes it can go a week. <laughs> and, and, and you have zero control over that sometimes. And then on top of that, it right. becomes a multiplier. Yeah. And then on top of that is factors we can't control, like the pandemic, like the weather, like the strikes, the storms, the external factors that you can introduce that. So the, I would say, those are the, and that's what we're talking about here, trying to figure out if there's ways maybe we can reduce these things. But th those are the three main ones that I see. And then you have customs. Um, I think we were talking a while back, you'll see like some country and customs, you, it's pretty streamlined. You send everything digitally, it works. In some countries, it's different. And there's variability there. And it's just, these pile up on top of one another. Okay, so all three of you have painted a picture that is not particularly rosy in terms of variability <laughs> in the supply chain today, which leads to the question, and maybe Yossi, I can ask you to kick off the answer to this one, and that is just can lead time variability even be reduced, or are we just doomed to stay with the state of affairs as it currently exists? No, there are, you can look at it as two ways, which you also actually kind of alluded to it already. You can take one way, is to have more control over the entire chain. That's certainly certainly what. Look, when you send an air freight package, there is usually very little variability because through the air, you bypass a lot of, you don't have to go to the port, to the yard, to the rail, to the truck, to the, you don't have to do it. You go air to it. Now there's a truck in the middle, but truck is, uh, does not have the same, uh, same issue. There's a lot, a lot of capacity. Uh, so one way is to have better control of, of the entire chain. Another way is to think that, uh, look, there's source of variability that, as, as, as Kronar mentioned, that you will not be able to control. There's, a, you know, port closures and, uh, and pandemic and war and uh, relation between U.S. and China and God knows what. And people don't show up for work at some place and all of this. The trick here is not so much to reduce variability, but be able to manage it and mitigate the impacts. 
So for example, knowing ahead of time that something happens, help you alert the customer, help you maybe reroute something, help you, because even because even when Ares is talking or, or, or mentioned or, or Granar mentioned, having control over the entire channel and trusting your, your supplier, what does it mean? You allow the supplier to make the changes because now that supplier control and they do not have to communicate with somebody else. They control the channel. So they can make the decisions about, okay, it came to the port late. I'm not gonna put it on a rail. I'm putting it on the truck. I mean, it's within their purview to make it and make it quickly. So you can, it's not that you eliminate variability, but you mitigate the, the impact of the variability. That's the other way to think about it. Through, a, through agility, I guess, through the ability to respond, even if some of these things can't be anticipated, as you say, the sudden closure of a port because of one COVID case. And how much how much notice ahead do you get of that before you can decide uh, what, what you need to do? In that case, you're just sort of helpless, aren't you? There was no notice in this one. It just announced. I, I, I don't know. Maybe Merce got the notice or, or Nigbo. I don't know. We have a center in Nigbo. We were totally surprised. Mm -hmm. Well, but, okay. So go on. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. I, I just want to top on that a little bit uh, of what Yossi said. So can it be done? Definitely it can. Will it be perfect? Probably not. Let me give you an example. So after we looked into the data uh, that I, I shared before, we decided to work with one of our customer, uh, a medium-sized retailer in, in the US, and say, let's take one port of origin and one destination in the US. So it was from Vietnam into the Texas area. And, and let's see, can we help you to reduce variability? So the, the original variability that they have was plus minus 25 days. It was not as bad as before, but close enough. And we said, can we actually do that? So we decided that for three months, we basically gonna uh, micromanage those shipments. Everything will be on our decision. We want, there's no need to ask for permission to do this or to do that as, as Yossi mentioned. And by the way, COVID just started when we <laughs> did that. It, it kind of came on top of it and, and like, hey, welcome. Here we are, and COVID and disruption is there. But we still managed to bring, and the agreement with, with that retailer was that a good means plus minus three days from the day that they promised, not plus, not zero. It doesn't need to be on the day, but plus minus three, it's good enough for everybody. Uh, you know, within a week for ocean end to end, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, so we managed for 94% of the time, we managed to bring it within that plus minus three days. But I can tell you, that it almost crushed us because <laughs> the micromanagement of, of first of all the visibility it was nightmare because even the, even we control the whole thing it sits in different system it's it's different people that needs to look into that so visibility was uh, if we want to success with this visibility is number one you need to understand where is the shipment at any given moment and what will happen the second thing to actually create something like this in a bigger scale, you need to start predicting what route to take. And this is actually, Yossi, I'm not sure if you're aware, you probably do. Uh, we're working with your team uh, to build the tool of that, that will help to actually look into the different routes and not always go from uh, Shanghai to LA and that's it, that's my choice. Because if LA is congested, and Shanghai has a problem, how can I actually come from a different route and take into account not just the vessels, but also the trucking capacity, the warehouse capacity, because uh, you don't just want to bring 40 foot container all the way to the middle of the country, that's expensive. You want to convert it to a 53 to reduce that. So taking all this into consideration and start giving scores to your route as you decide to move the shipment, not for in general, because things changing all the time. That could be uh, the second part after you have the visibility. And of course, you keep going back to the visibility in order to see if you need to change this route along the way. So, so I think it's possible. I don't think we'll ever come to a perfect world, but you know, we can improve dramatically from where we are today. But, but one let, of the things- Let me add something then. Yeah. When you go at this point, part of the difficulty was you had to do it by hand. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, you, as you are, let's assume just look at, look at, let's assume you have multiple large retailers doing it and you have millions of, uh, uh, of packet, million of uh, uh, shipments moving and you start collecting data, what worked, what didn't work. I mean, doing, you know, machine learning on millions and millions of data points, you may be able to just deal with the exception. So humans will just deal with the exception and a lot of the changes because there's control that can be done algorithmically. So one can look at the future. Maybe it would take a while to develop the system and the data. And, and, the, and, and, and as you said, you must have the visibility, you must have everything, but you can look at the future and say, for a company like Merce that has the ability to develop systems like, uh, like this, it can be something to look forward yeah. to. Definitely. It's such a calc it's such a complex calculation. We're hearing not only machine learning and artificial intelligence coming into the picture, but quantum computing as a tool for the, for coming up with these these calculations. But well, you'll see. You know, there have been attempts in the past to control the end to end supply chain. Some have worked, and some have not worked. Can you maybe give us some examples of in both in both cases? Well, the famous example is the. Uh... You know, Sealand and, and, and CSX, when the uh, railroad and uh, you know, uh, ocean liners, uh, ocean carrier were under some uh, same control. It, you know, it worked for a while and then they decided that, that you know, it doesn't work. There's a, there's a, the problem here is, is the problem. Look, we talked a lot about the possible benefits of this. I mean, I just mentioned it. I'm also looking at the, at the future benefit, not only right now, future benefit. The problem is, as we know, as companies grow, they become by and large more bureaucratic. So yep. companies start growing, 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 and it looks good until it doesn't look good. Until, you know, so, so, so the question is, my answer is maybe I, it, it could work, but uh, in the past, it doesn't. In the passenger um, arena, United Airlines bought, what is it, uh, Hertz, I think, and then Sarah uh, tried to control the whole personal trip, and it doesn't, did, didn't work uh, for a variety of reasons. So, uh, you know, there have been, I understand the pluses, I understand the excitement of, of doing this, and it's certainly, especially after look, in fact, that's the time to do it after customer experience the pandemic and they say, oh my God, variability is robbing us blind. Um, yeah. Do something about it. Yet, we'll see. Well, it feels like the concept should work in theory because as you say, the fewer players involved and fewer handoffs involved, the more the simpler it is, the less variability and the faster things move through. But there have, as you point out, Yossi, been a number of attempts in the past in order to make this work and some have not worked. And, and maybe I could ask you, Arez, since this is exactly what Maersk is undertaking right now, is attempting to gain greater control over the total logistics supply chain, end-to-end -end control to mitigate this variability we're talking about today. Why do we think it's going to work in today's environment, Erez, when in the past it hasn't necessarily? I, I think few few points that have a better chance to make it successful. First of all, it's it's the ability to control the whole end-to-end -end by one vendor. And, and there's not so many people in the world that can do that. Uh, Maersk is one of them. Don't want to promote anything here for Maersk, but there are a few others. But in the past, it was not exist. There were always some handover of at least portion of it that kind of, uh, uh, sure. as we discussed earlier, creating another problems of viability. I think the second thing that is important, of course, the the end-to-end -end control is one. The second thing is, in the past, it was much more difficult to really have the right visibility of thing. You you were depending on um, EDI kind of messaging that coming a little bit mm. after the fact, and, and if it's even coming, and maybe yeah. a day <laughs> or a week later, you can't live with that, right? You need real-time uh, knowledge of what's going on with the ship and which today it's kind of already maturing it's it's here it's there and i think the last thing is is you need an organization that's willing to invest and build those systems because as we said but uh, yossi mentioned it i mentioned it now 
you can't run it manually. There is no way you can run this thing manually. So you need, and it's quite heavy investment to take all this system, all this information and put it into um, the machine learning, the algorithm, the quantum computing. This is an expensive exercise that takes a few years. And, and I think in the past there was no, uh, somebody, people did not see the, the light at the end of the tunnel, so they, they didn't even invest in that. Right now, we do believe there is a potential to make it happen. Uh, we're actually talking to a few of the customers that want to be part of this exercise of testing it. So there is definitely a very interest to invest into that and actually make it happen and successful. So yeah. that's kind of uh, the reason I believe there is a better chance for it to be successful. Interesting. And and I, Kanoa, what I, do you... I would adjust, I, I would adjust one yourself. more reason that the uh, errors may be too you know, modest to say, it, but the quality of the MERSC organization I mean, that's a very high quality organization. Lots of smart people. And if anybody can pull it off, Maersk has a very good chance uh, to do it. Great. I'm happy, this, I'm happy it's recording. <laughs> I, I don't get it off from yes. We're gonna, we'll edit that out of, this, of the event. Um, no, I, I do wanna ask Krenar, you know, because you guys are all about end-to-end -end visibility. That's your whole thing. Uh, right. Why do you think, what's different now, Krenar, <laughs> that suggests that this whole end-to-end control to mitigate the variability might actually work this time around. Yeah, I mean, the, the big thing that's different these days, as Eri said, like one area is the visibility part of things. And visibility, when I look at that in our context, is technology that's advanced that was not here five or 10 or 20, 30 years ago when CSX got merged with CLAN trying to, 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 to make that happen. And technology, now you can create literally a smartphone <laughs> inside of every single shipment to be able to tell anywhere in the world where that shipment is and what's happening with it. So you can take action um, and, and figure out how to make, mitigate variability. But the other way to think of it is, it, I think the, 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 the debate could be, or is this really gonna work is think of a computer, like Intel makes a microprocessor, there's Samsung makes the RAM, but Intel is not making the whole PC. They're taking hyper-specialized vendors who are making these things really, really well and then putting them together. And then IBM or Lenovo or I Apple is putting all those pieces together. Maybe one way to look at it is because that is interconnected and standardized and everything works really well together, we can do that. But we're still in that phase in supply chain where standardization is happening and standardization around visibility is gonna happen more and more. So everybody and all those pieces can collaborate more well together. I believe like Erez said, there is light at the end of the tunnel and this is that time, whether it's five years, 10 years, but it's in this time frame where all of this is gonna happen. So it's technology and that collaboration piece where standardization of communication where it used to be EDIs, now it's APIs as a, as a quick example. And a lot, of it, a lot of it is because we just went through the pandemic and companies saw that the up and down and the craziness and not having part and the customers screaming at them and yeah. they, you know everybody try and, and it's even unpleasant for companies who don't have enough part to make allocation decisions because they know that somebody will be unhappy. I mean, it's not like they can, as I said, I, so I, I'm talking to companies who are in, in, uh, trying to do it in all kind of, in all kind of way. So, Nobody is happy and people and boards are starting to say, okay, let's let's make sure that it doesn't continue to happen, that it doesn't happen in the future. So that's the time the comp and also because of this, there's more in general, not only in MERF, there's more money in supply chain. And there's yeah. more in, in general, in manufacturing, in retail, people understand venture capital, even. And of course, venture capital, yeah. people understand sure. the role the role of supply chain. So it's a you know, in fact, uh, I always say that by, you know, January 2020, until January 2020, people used to ask my wife, what's your husband doing? She used to say, <laughs> doing recently supply chain. People say, what is that? And, you know, a year later, my wife walked into Whole Foods and asked the, the, the clerk that, that, that she likes, she knows for a long time, why you don't have oranges? So, you know, we have supply chain problems. <laughs> so this, is, <laughs> this is when it gets to everybody. 
Yeah, I've had I've had my own children try to explain to me what what the problem with supply chain is when they've ordered stuff and hasn't come. They said, "Well, Dad, you know, it's a supply chain, you know." And I said, "Thanks a lot for enlightening me on that one. I really appreciate it." So Remember, Mark, it's not one supply chain. <laughs> it's not. If there's anything, audience, you want to take away from these three episodes, it's that, that's what Yossi points out, there is not one supply chain. It's so much more complicated than that. But I just wonder if we're doomed to this. I hope we're not doomed to this pendulum thing where we go from consolidation of service providers and then they all break up in their core competencies and they say, well, that's not working. Let's go the other way. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. Are we going to actually achieve some, you know, some model that's going to last based on the re real world. Well, Yossi, what do you what do you think? Well, first of all, if you talk about the uh, you know ultimate vertically integrated is Ford Motor Company of you know the beginning of, of the 20th century. They control everything. Yeah. A more modern example is Samsung. They control. They don't control everything, but they call large part of the supply chain. They make the chips for the TV and the TV and sell them and all of this. So they are. It's a. There's always the debate between, you know, best in class, focus on your core competency versus, you know, going uh, going all out, all out. Would would Maersk be able to manage well a trucking company or a warehouse or a, you know, it takes it takes customs, customs broker and uh, yeah, all that stuff. Broker, what have you? Uh, so all of this is uh, up for debate. But one thing I have to, you know maybe disagree with you or just cast it differently. I don't think we ever will get to a stable situation because the environment is changing all the time. What we have to get is to a situation where we can continuously adjust. So maybe, right. I'm just saying, maybe Maersk will start controlling the whole channel. Then they realize, okay, it's okay to control this part of the channel, but the other part not, or, or this guy doesn't work and they'll, you know, spin it off and, and put another another person. I don't know. It's a, it's exciting to me that the company of the size and capacity of MERS is trying to do it. Because as 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 Eric said, not too many companies can do it. So yeah. We'll see. Well, you know, we've been talking for these minutes about about consolidation or not consolidation end to end and all this kind of stuff. And a lot of it seems to be very internally focused from a company standpoint, you know, whether it benefits the service provider or the uh, shipping line or whatever, or doesn't. But I think the basic question here is why should shippers care about what we're talking about today? How does it affect them? Whether or not they're dealing with five or six different parties and getting their stuff from point A to point B versus one or two. Um, what they care okay. about is, is getting it in time, knowing where it is. And this yeah. just needs to get there. I, I don't know, Eris uh, should, should take uh, yeah. it. Yeah. I, th I think it's if it's it doesn't matter you get it from five vendors, from one or whatever. It, if you if you able to reduce the transit time viability, the number one thing you're gonna get is less safety stock. You don't need that much of a safety stock because you're not planning now for 70, for you remember the 34, 74 days. When you I asked the, our case. Yeah, when I asked the customers, so what are you doing with that? They say, oh, oh, we are planning on the 90 something percentile. So they're planning on the 70 days or so. And if you take end to end, they're planning on the 140, 150 days. So mm -hmm. instead of ordering a supply for 150 days, that is actually coming much faster on an average, right? Average is a dangerous thing. I don't like to use it, but most of the time it comes more than the 98th percentile, 94 percentile. So your, your stocks and, and your warehouse sitting and piling up with stocks that maybe or maybe not you're gonna sell and maybe or maybe not uh, you'll have space for them. So that that that's why they should care, you know? And, and we're already seeing it from a lot of people that the COVID kind of gave a slap in the face and wake them up that, hey, we need to do it slightly different. Uh, automotive, of course, the just-in-time story that they used to be proud of it so much is suddenly not so much working anymore, you yeah. know? So all, all those type of things, and this is a good example for people that trying not to keep safety stock, of course, but they, they're pushing it to their vendors to keep, that's another story. But they don't, they, they do something, there's something else. It's another uh, source of uh, cost, and this is especially in automotive, I do a lot of work with automotive, they expedite. 
So when happen when you know when there's a problem, they actually because of GMP, they don't have the stock, so they send a truck, they send a semi trailer just to take a small package from the supplier to oh. the plant. Sometimes they'll send a helicopter. I mean to take it to take or, it because or, or they move large shipments from ocean to air, which you know how much is more expensive. Or they move shipments from ocean to air. Yeah. I mean this is this this expediting is is millions and millions of dollars that the automotive companies are spending because they're trying to keep the just in time. Yeah. Okay, listen, this has been a great discussion from all of you, but I want to give the audience a chance to chime in with their own questions. So let's move in now to the audience question and answer portion of our discussion. And even as we are answering the questions that have already come in, audience members are encouraged to continue to submit your questions by clicking on that Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And we'll get to as many of your questions as we possibly can, time permitting. So here's an audience question, and I guess... Uh, refers to what Arez uh, was alluding to. He says, what Arez is alluding to is that to achieve full visibility, the company must integrate vertically, question mark. Would that strategy be more productive and cost-effective when it can reduce the capacity to innovate internally and miss opportunities of leveraging external innovations and collaborations? Interesting. Um, you know, can, can the big consolidated company be, a, be innovative? What do you think, Arez? Uh, so... That's not what I'm alluding to, right? There's okay. definitely, definitely, there is a lot of room for innovation, uh, collaboration between the company and its suppliers, right? It, it cannot be a one part creating a lot of innovation and, and there's nothing happen on the other side. It, it, it needs to come hand to hand. It needs to come from what problem you are trying to solve as, as, as a customer or as a, a, what are you trying to achieve? What do you care about? How do you want to do that? There is a lot of room for joint innovation, uh, which I believe is, is needed. Uh, I think the other part was, uh, do you need to vertically integrate it in order to get visibility? No, of course. You, all you need is, is uh, some type of devices and you will get the visibility, right? But, but I think the visibility is, is an important thing. And on, what do you do with that visibility, right? Without the visibility, there's nothing for you to do, first of all. But the moment you get the visibility, how do you act upon it? And who is running that end, end of movements between if you're still using multiple vendors, that's a difficult task to do. So, uh, you know, many large companies might be successful on that. A smaller one might have more trouble to be uh, uh, successful in this. Well, Yossi, what do you think of the stereotype of the agile small company versus the yeah. uh, bureaucratic yeah. big one? So, of course, in, in, in every statement like this, there's an element of truth. But there have been, in the last, call it 20 years, fundamental changes. I don't think anybody would, would call Amazon or Apple not innovative. <laughs> That's for sure. That's true. That trillion dollar company. Trillion dollars. Whoever heard about trillion dollar companies? These are one, two, three trillion dollar company. And they keep being, they keep innovating all the time, coming up with new stuff. Not only coming up with a different iPhone, but coming up with different way of, of, uh, uh, of doing business. Amazon. Amazon is moving. By the way, Amazon is classic for admitting mistakes immediately. They move into phones and they immediately got, hey, that's not working. Okay, let's let's move, let's do something else. That's to see large companies acting in many ways like startup is actually amazing to, to me because this was not always, always the case, but they are influencing everybody. People are now starting to realize I am working with, let's talk in one of the large integrators and they, and, they're looking at this and they're trying to change the processes to make much faster decision-making, much faster consideration, have meetings when everybody stands up. I mean, the little things, but move things faster, move the decision-making uh, yeah, faster. Yeah. So it, it Kren happens. Krenar, 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 what do you think on the tech also, side uh, also, to this let question? Me just, let me just add one thing. Okay. People, a lot of people are following 3M and Google in letting engineers, giving them some time to innovate on their own. And right. So it, we have processes in large companies that are starting to do it. Kernard, do you have a you have a perspective on this? 
I, I would say I, um, I, Yossi, um, I'm with you and Arez, I agree. It's not, a, I don't think you're alluding to kind of, the, it needs to be fully integrated. I think that, that it doesn't have to be anymore just because of technology and advances that are happening um, that we've talked about. Like Arez said, we can put a time and know exactly where everything is. And then you can take that data and integrate it in any other system that you need. You can be, I think more and more companies are becoming more and more open on sharing data and collaborating. We just need to figure out what parts of data we need to share so that at the end we can mitigate these variabilities. And I think this is this is happening. And it's a Yossi, it's amazing to watch these large companies because they're infectious in a way globally. And they're teaching all companies, even like us, startups and scale-ups to behave that way so we can make quicker decisions and just face the facts the way they are and move on. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess the question also has to be, and this is a good question, and that is, do data silos still exist to the extent that this information is not flowing in an efficient and quick manner between independent parties? I mean, Arez, you don't, you guys don't own the entire supply chain, obviously, nor would you probably ever want chain. to. <laughs> but uh, I mean, are, are, are the various holders of data sharing it sufficiently, or are we look, still looking at a siloed situation and some bumps in the road? Uh, definitely, there is a need to share data, uh, but but I think it's uh, going to be a very difficult thing uh, between competitors, between uh, different companies, between different platforms and, and type of data. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. uh, trying to get hands on data today. It's so difficult because everybody sees it as the new gold, of course, right? Data is is the key. Uh, so sharing data to a level, I, I definitely believe it's near the level where it you should, uh, and what you should share, what you should not share as, as this is your own, you know, you, you, you're not expecting Amazon to go and share the final customer browsing uh, history and what they're looking, it's, they never gonna share. That's what they making it uh, successful for their own. You know, they can start moving around, but, you know, a congestion or, or certain port uh, problems or, or uh, relatively or other kind of high level thing that everybody have some uh, visibility to it, that's definitely uh, should be shared. But, but Yossi, as you know, uh, in the past, the, uh, the as these systems for tracking and tracing arose, each carrier develop their own in-house as a proprietary advantage or what they saw as a proprietary thing. And, you know, that doesn't do the shippers any good to have to go through five or six different uh, systems in order to track their, to track their cargo. Uh, is that still the case? Is still the case or has that problem essentially been solved? Everything can be, can be solved, but <laughs> most things can be, uh, let me put it this way. Technology questions can be solved. Hmm. Human questions, Beyond my capability. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think it's, it's serious because it's it's uh, what people are willing to do and not willing to do is something in the psyche, is something in their in you know uh, in culture. Mm -hmm. Technology wise, yeah, I can scrape website. I can do. I can find information. I can I can combine FedEx and and, and you know and UPS to one stream if that's what I need to do. Um, no. That's not the issue, but the, the issue is the, the willingness, you know, uh, to share, the willingness to do it. Uh, yeah. Not not putting undue hurdles on the on the technology of sharing. Yeah. Well, here again is the answer to why shippers should care, because it makes a difference if they're not uh, sharing information properly and dealing with all those different entities and different systems can be a real pain for a shipper. Um, here is a question uh, again for Erez about Maersk specifically, and the question is. Is Maersk planning to invest in assets along the supply chain, including trucking, warehousing and distribution, custom houses, et cetera? If yes, how long can this take? And can, and can it actually, is it actually doable at a global scale? If not, how can Maersk control the variabilities along the way if they still outsource through the same vendors on the market? So I don't know who asked it, but maybe he's working for Musk because it sounds like <laughs> it sounds like a tea, a, a tea question for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
listen, definitely Musk is willing and not just planning and already doing it quite heavily. Uh, the last five years is a big investment in, in everything along the supply chain. I give you a few examples. Uh, three years ago in North America, we had 20 warehouses that we controlled. Today we are sitting on 148. Uh, wow. It will it will come and there is the plan to grow is dramatically more than what is already happening. In terms of trucking, we probably had uh, a control of uh, I don't know what 50 trucks a few years back. Today we are talking about few thousands of them. Here I'm talking only North America, and we're doing the same thing everywhere in the world. We we invest both. Uh, in our own growth, but we're also going into acquisitions that help to expedite it because we understand we cannot take 20 years to develop it and slowly grow to where we, we will need. So, so the investment, uh, I'll give you another example. Who would think of Maersk as an airline? Maersk is an airline for many, many years actually, and just recently added, it's called Star Air, by the way, you just Google it, you'll see the logo of Musk sitting on, on an airplane. Now we have, we always had like three or four aircraft. Now we have, uh, we just put an order for about six or seven aircraft. Some of them already started. Uh, so definitely Musk is, is, is planning and doing uh, investment along the whole supply web or supply chain, how we want to call it, because I agree it's not one supply chain, in order to be able to do that kind of end-to-end uh, uh, -end as we're talking about. So, so the answer is yes, absolutely yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this question sort of asking you to kind of double down on what you were saying earlier, and that is, does end-to-end -end control actually increase decision-making velocity when it comes to dealing with variability? Why don't I start with Krenar on that one and then go around the table? It did better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it has to, right? It just, if once you have full control over, I mean, I was just talking to somebody recently around some of the ship, they're pretty really big e-commerce company and they were, they, they ship things, but if they were using a third-party logistics service provider on some decisions that they had to make once it arrived at a port, whether it's going to go by rail or by truck, and that decision process was just a few weeks ahead of time because uh, that they had to make because they don't they couldn't see everything in real time, and now they put a little distribution center next to the port so they can make the decision right away whether they need that by truck put in distribution center so they can ship to customers or by rail and use it for later they took control over that piece so they can make decisions quicker. So yes, if you had full control, obviously you can make decisions much quicker. But I think to get there, there's multiple ways to get there. Let me get some quick answers from the other two on our panel. Uh, Yossi. What was the question? I mean, I... Does end-to-end -end control actually increase decision-making velocity when it comes to dealing with variability? As I said, it did better. The, it whole, did better, yeah. the whole rationale for doing this is to increase the velocity uh, of decision making. And, and, and as I said, right now it may be painful because it's a combination of some, some software and some uh, manual decision making. But as, as we, as we you know, collect more and more data and more and more situation, it would allow machine learning to be able to predict better and start making algorithmic decisions, start taking right. off the manual you know, uh, portion and start large and large portion is going to be done automatically and this would be very helpful okay Erez, what do you think this is actually happening 100 percent, 100 percent agree yes it's going to give a, a, a better velocity uh, every time that you if you have an end-to-end -end control every time you see a problem or you predict a problem you don't need to already be into that problem but you predict i will have a problem here if you have the full control on the end-to-end, -end, you immediately can route it in a different way. You can take a different action to overcome that problem and, and actually never be into that problem anymore. Where if you are not, it, you will hit that problem and now you need, hey, what do I do next? And then, oh, let's do that and try to mitigate. But it's already too late. If you're into the problem, it's already too late. So now you can actually it's like a Google map. It, it sends you from a place that you never ever thought that you're going to be going through, uh, but there's no traffic anymore. So, so that's right. 
the end to end is super important. Okay, we are just about out of time. We have time for one final question, and I'm going to direct it to Krenar. It is as follows. If the freight market is still fragmented, that is no end to end control at the moment, what can a shipper do? Good question. <laughs> as we've talked about through entire like this conversation here, we know that there's not one supply chain, there's many supply chain and there's fragmented today. Um, we talked about variability, which was the big topic. And because of variability, how do we be able to get velocity on decision making so we can mitigate the variabilities that we see inside supply chain? One way to do that, one way to do that, is we talked about full control of end to end, but the other way is through visibility. So you understand what's happening throughout the supply chain. You understand where the variabilities are. What I would do as a shipper, if you can't measure something, if you don't know what's going on, there's nothing you can do about it. So you start by measuring. The first thing is you need to start getting data and that measurement, I would focus on the most fragmented one, the one that gives you the biggest headaches, the one that gives you the biggest variability of plus minus days on lead time or other uh, issues that you're having. And you can start by using devices like ours and trackers to understand what's happening with that data so you can take action. I would say start there, start with one chain, start with the biggest fragmentation and then move it across the entire supply chain uh, that you have in the business. Thank you so much. Well, maybe end-to-end -end enterprises will work this time around, and uh, we can certainly uh, we'll look forward to getting more insights from all of you gentlemen in the future about this. And in the meantime, I really want to thank all of you, Yossi Sheffi, Krenar Kamoni, and Erez Agmoni for a fantastic presentation. And I want to thank our audience, too, for your attendance and asking your great questions. Now, this, of course, just keep in mind, these are three episodes in a single series. More information here. Episodes one, two, and three are available on demand. Go check out the Tive website, tive.com. And here also is a report from Gartner on sh to shockproof your supply chain for the new age of disruption. There is a QR code that you can use in order to access that. But don't worry, also, this access information will be provided to all of you attendees in an email uh, at the conclusion of this presentation. So once again, thanks to our great panel. Thank you very much to our audience. And everybody, have a great day.